Hi, I had some comments on the video I released yesterday um, from a third worldist. A guy called Zulu says there are lots of ways in which first worldism is erroneous, but the fact that Paul left constant capital out of the equation while comparing the supposed productivity of labour between workers and US and India is plain embarrassing. Now, I replied that I left the labour content of the depreciated constant capital out, but unless the workforce producing means of production in the US steel industry was of the order of half a million workers, which is highly unlikely, it would not change the substance of the argument. Now, in fact, I, over, I understated my case there. I went on to say that if you want, you can go and use the input-output tables for India and the US to check this. And that's what I've done. Um, let's just show you the, the sources of data. I have the Indian input-output table for 2017 and you can readily go along and look at the basic metals industry okay and for basic metals we can go down and look at the ratio of intermediate products to total value added if we scroll along we can see that that is 79 is intermediate products and value added is 84 so Uh, 156 intermediate products value added 35 we you can easily do the same for the USA um, here's the 2019 table I couldn't get the 2017 table but there won't have been much changes over two years and again you can find the um, primary metals it's called in this case and do the same thing well, let's look at the actual calculations I've done to check out what Zulu says. At the top here, you see my original calculation, which showed that in terms of physical productivity and therefore value productivity, the workers in the directly employed in the steel industry in the USA were 6.7 times higher. Now, it's true I didn't include the constant capital that is to say the raw materials and wear and tear and machinery used up in the two steel industries if you look at the cost structure of the steel industry it's overwhelmingly made up of the constant capital is overwhelmingly made up of things like um, iron ore coal or scrap metal and a certain amount of other metals used for alloying. Um, now let's take the Indian figures I just showed you 156 uh, thousand million to uh, 35,000 million value added. US figures 177 thousand million um, of intermediate products 65,000 million value added so what is the ratio of dead to living labor in these two cases well in the Indian case it's 4.4 in the US case it's 2.8 so actually this is not what I expected but actually the US has a lower organic composition of capital in the steel industry than the Indian industry or at least on a flow basis it does. Now I had previously said that there was just under 100,000 workers in the US steel industry, uh, just over a third of a, a million workers in the Indian steel industry and that was direct labour. Now if this is basically the dead to living labour ratio according to Marx.
The C over V plus S is the dead to living labour ratio. So that the, in, the dead labour is indirect labour that was performed in the rest of the economy in order to allow production to take place in the steel industry. And this implied that in the US there was the an indirect labour force of roughly a quarter of a just over a quarter of a million, giving a total labour force of around 375,000. Do the same calculations for India and you get an indirect labour force of about 2.9 million and a total labour force of about 3.6 million and the output per worker is obviously going to be lower now in both cases um, because we're counting the indirect um, labour performed as well so we're not counting just the work in the steel mills but we're counting the work in the iron ore mines, the work in the coal mines, the work in the quarries digging out limestone and the output per, per worker total worker employed in the, the US case will be 234 tonnes per worker, in the Indian case 24 tonnes per worker. And this means that the productivity ratio that I gave yesterday is, was actually an underestimate. The US steel industry, if you count both direct and indirect labour, is 9.7 times as productive as the Indian steel industry. So far from my ignoring the constant capital, strengthening the, the Zulu's case, it actually greatly weakens it. Once you include it, you find that in fact the productivity difference between the two industries is even greater. And that's presumably because the, the productivity in the um, mining industries in the US is markedly higher than the mining industries in, in India or at least the gap in productivity between mining in the US and mining in India is greater than the gap in productivity in direct steel production. So the basic thesis that I was arguing that the ceiling to the level of wages in India is set much lower by the lower development of the productive forces is reinforced if I take into account the indirect labour, the labour required to produce the means of production. Um, now, Zulu got his uh, response in first by saying anyway third worlders consider um, input output analysis to be largely outdated well let's see what is the alternative method of analyzing the economy than input output analysis since for the last 70 years or so Marxist ec economics has been largely based on the use of input output analysis and since input-output analysis is a generalization of the, the method Marx developed in volume two of Capital, let's see what these non-Marxist uh, input, uh, non-Marxist third worldists are proposing. Perhaps you could propose, you could cite actual economics articles which give an alternative to input-output analysis. <laughs>